All right. Good morning, everyone, if you're in the US. Good afternoon, if you're in the UK or in Europe. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you today? Good. How are you, Chris? Good. Very good. Very good. Very nice to be here. So welcome to a new episode of Body Swaps and Friends webinar. Um, today, it's called the Nurses versus AI. Can simulation be trusted to build human skills? My name is Christophe Mallet. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Body Swaps. Um, Body Swaps is essentially a flight simulator for soft skills that does use AI. But today is not about body swaps. It's about hearing from pioneers in education, especially around, around simulations uh, that are Stephanie and, and Elizabeth and, and listening to them tell us what they're seeing uh, on, the, on the other side of that, of, of that new frontier. And we'll try to, um, we'll try to make it fun. Um, before we start, I just wanted to set the stage. Um, you might have felt a little bit of a cognitive dissonance uh, going online in the past year. Um, and that's just an example. Those two posts are pretty much from the same day. I think it's May 2023. On the left, you have a Daily Mail, which is a newspaper that is not worth the paper it's printed on. Uh, but that says, you know, AI could wipe out humanity. The threat is that bad as nuclear war must be tackled, say, tech bosses. So they're doing what they do, which is they are selling fear. On the right, you have uh, Mark Andreessen, uh, general manager of Andreessen Horowitz, uh, in a podcast saying that AI will save the world. Uh, Mark Andreessen is a billionaire. Uh, he invests in startups. So he's selling what he sells, which is investment uh, opportunity. And as always, the, the reasonable middle, the silence majority, doesn't know uh, where they stand. So today is about neither of those extremes. It's about really understanding how AI applied to something very specific uh, can work, but also what the, what the limits are. You might have heard the story of a guy named Willie Arnold in 1995 who woke up uh, in the operating room to find that the wrong leg had been uh, amputated. Um, this was not a, a medical error in the sense of the surgeon didn't know what they were doing hard skills wise uh, or you know, uh, anatomically. This was the result of a broken communication chain that included not checking in uh, with the uh, with the patient, and um, so Willie lost a leg. Uh, the hospital lost a settlement for one million dollar, and a doctor uh, also had to pay a quarter of a uh, of a of a million dollar. And it seems like an anecdotal story, but over seventy percent of adverse events in healthcare uh, result from a, a a communication error. And what's worse, in a study from twenty eighteen that looks specifically at orthopedic surgeons. Uh, 75% of surgeons believe that they are communicating well with their patients, but only 21% of the patients think the same. So you see here a, a, a huge gap, not only in skills, but in the perception of one's skills. And this is confirmed by the World Economic Forum, who posted a future of jobs report a couple of months ago. And those are the, the skills that are the top priority to reskill in healthcare. Um, and you see soft skills there, leadership, social influence, empathy, active listening, teaching, and, and mentoring. So what we have is a wide shared need to upskill the entire healthcare workforce, be it students or, or you know, practitioners, around those skills. So how can you do this today? Well, it turns out there is a trade-off between learning performance and scalability. So clinical placement, it's the real thing, and you get the mentoring, which is great. But there are also issues around the exposure and the variety of cases. Um, there are issues around the costs, the logistics, the access to those opportunities, uh, and of course, the safety of the patient. On the other end, you have e-learning, which is very cheap, anytime, anywhere. Um, but the issue with e-learning is... Well, learning to break bad news by reading a bunch of acronyms on PowerPoint slides will be as useful when you actually have to do it as learning to swim by watching a video, right? E-learning can be great for the acquisition of knowledge. It just doesn't work for the acquisition of human skills. And so you have standardized uh, patience and role play, which is great because you get controlled practice with real human beings and you get that feedback, but also has limitation. Uh, there's often not enough practice to really have an impact on behavior. 
uh, and is obviously limits with the, the consistency of the experience across the learners, uh, the lack of data uh, to, show, uh, to show progress around, um, and finally, the lack of psychological safety. Most learners just do not like it. So today's question is, where is AI-powered simulations for soft skills going to land? You know, is it going to be slightly more scalable but less good than SPs? Is it going to be slightly better for psychological safety but maybe a bit less scalable? Is it going to be worse than any other solution or are you going to be better on both, uh, on both uh, uh, dimensions? Today, we're not expecting to have a definitive answer to that question simply because the technology is developing. The objective of today is to not be that guy. Um, if anyone knows who that guy is, uh, please post in the uh, in the comments. Um, that guy is called uh, Mac Wheeler Arthur. This is a video surveillance camera footage from 1995 when one morning he robbed two banks with no disguise. The only thing he was wearing on his face was lemon juice. Um, the reason why he was wearing lemon juice is because um, he knew that lemon juice was used as invisible ink, and therefore he saw that lemon juice could make him invisible to the cameras. And so you have in that case such a gap between what he knows and what he thinks his ability is that this prompted two researchers, uh, Dunning and Kruger, to, to research the relationship between a uh, level of knowledge uh, and level of confidence in your, uh, uh, in your ability. But you can also think about the orthopedic surgeons from before who think they are great, but their ability isn't that great, right? And so in the Dunning-Kruger effect, and that applies to any field of knowledge, when you know nothing, you're generally very confident in your ability or your opinion about that thing. This here is called Twitter. Right, that that's where most people on, on, on Twitter are, and then as you start learning more and more, you fall into the valley of despair. You realize that things are complex and it's a little bit scary. And I certainly feel a lot like this about AI. And then progressively, you climb back up the slope of enlightenment until you reach the plateau of sustainability. So what we're going to do um, before Stephanie presents is, I invite everyone. Uh, in here to uh, join, to go on menti.com, uh, M-E-N-T-I.com, uh, and to enter uh, that code. And I'm going to ask you where you are on the Dunning-Kruger line. So if you go on there, Elizabeth, Stephanie, you can, you can, you can do it as well, even though I have, a, I have an idea of where, where you might be. Um, we should see that data come in. I expect a few. Okay, um, as this as this comes in, I think the the, the idea for, for for today really is to to see if we can shape um, shape that uh, that peak um, a, a little bit. Um, I think if you're here today, you're probably not at the peak of Mount Stupid. Otherwise, you wouldn't have joined a a, a webinar. Um, so. Whether we're finding you in the valley of despair or already on on, on the slope, is a, is an interesting question. Um, I'm going to stop stop here. There might be some more data coming, but we don't have that much time. So um, I am going to um, go now to Stephanie, and this is the moment where I awkwardly read a piece of paper with your introduction. Um, so Dr. Stephanie Justice is an assistant clinical professor at the Ohio State University College of Nursing working in the Center for Healthcare Innovation and Leadership. She helped to plan and is the faculty lead for the XR Lab. In addition to her work in XR, she teaches courses across the nursing curriculum, including global community health, nursing theory, and evidence-based practice for innovation. Dr. Justice is a certified healthcare simulation educator, virtual reality educator, and a moulage artist. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, super excited to be here today. Um, I just, I absolutely love VR and simulation for nursing. So um, when I got asked to speak, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Um, and I'm going to apologize if you can hear my dogs in the background because um, I am working from home and apparently the puppy wants to be part of the presentation. So um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about AI and nursing. And um, if you guys want to flip, there we go. And that is me. Um, I'd love to connect with people as well. If you'd like to continue this conversation after everything's done, um, if you, there we go. Um, our XR lab at Ohio State, I have to acknowledge that it is partially funded by the American Nurses Foundation Reimagining Nursing Grant. Um, and that is actually what really got us started in our journey into VR and AI. Um, so we are using quite a bit of different um, simulations and programs at Ohio State um, at the College of Nursing. And I want to talk a little bit about how we're using AI. Um, I'm not specifically going to be mentioning any companies that we're working with, um, but I am going to talk about how we're using it. So the first way is actually we've been doing patient care scenarios. And that would be my next slide. We've trialed, I don't know how many different products, um, and there's just a varying level of realism in these conversations. In some of the AI, um, you ask a question and it's a very long pause. Um, and this can be either in a headset or on a screen. Um, it's both times, you'll get some lag time. Or there are times when it forgets what it tells you or changes the story. And I've seen that a little bit with the AI on some of their history. And then you have to determine, is it an AI glitch or is your patient confused? Because that definitely changes how you're going to care for that patient. One of the software programs I tried, the patient likes to agree to do something. Like if I ask them you know, if I'm doing a neuro exam and I'm like, will you smile for me? And they're like, yes, but they don't change their face at all. So it doesn't actually respond. It says it will, but it doesn't. And so what I think is really missing is the right prompts. You know, everything needs to be very specific, very realistic. So if they're short of breath and um, we've played around a little bit with writing some of the prompts with, you know, some of these scenarios and you make the patient short of breath or you say you're having trouble breathing, but it doesn't sound like it. And, you know, as nurses, that's part of the problem, because if I'm assessing someone who's really short of breath, they're going to be talking kind of <laughs> like this. And you have the heavy breathing and the pauses and they can't form those complete sentences. And I've yet to hear an AI that actually sounds like that to me. Um, and so that's going to change my assessment, right? Because we've all had the patient who's like, oh yeah, I feel horrible. And they're sitting there, you know, eating a Twinkie and talking on the phone and watching, you know, TV at the same time. And it, you, you have that kind of mismatch of what you're seeing versus how they actually act. Um, and of course that ability to act on prompts, you know, can you sit up or can you lay down? And it really needs to do that. If it just says yes, then I don't really know it can. So that's a little bit of a challenge. But where I really feel like our AI, this is probably the one of the most exciting to me is in that soft skill training. You know, we have a hard time teaching students and teaching empathy and understanding, you know, and actually letting them experience those conversations. I feel like a lot of our students, you know, and shoot my son as well, you know, they're, we're all very tied to our telephones, right? We text each other rather than having conversations. And then we go into the hospital and we're caring for patients. And it's just so much more challenging to have that real conversation, to be able to ask the right questions and do that communication effectively. And so, you know, we've done work with standardized patients and I love standardized patients because I think it's great to talk to real humans. But the problem with that is if you have five SPs and they all do it just a little bit different, you have five different student experiences where with AI, if AI is working correctly, every student will have that same experience. And so for me, that's one of the biggest benefits with AI. I can't wait to see it a little bit better in some of the simulations um, as far as the patient care, but definitely in our soft skill training, I feel like AI is, is amazing. Thanks a lot. Um, that, was, that was amazing. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Great, great intro. And I think the first point here is that that's not, you know, it's not because it's there that it's great or terrible. There are there are uh, 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 variations to it and, and still a lot of progress um, to, to do. Um, Elizabeth, your turn to uh, listen to me reading your bio, which is always an awkward moment. Um, so let's get, let's get on with it. Dr. Elizabeth Stone is an associate professor at the University of North Carolina, right near our offices uh, at Chapel Hill School of Nursing. She's also a certified healthcare simulation educator. In 2023, Elizabeth and a medical school colleague received an internal grant to trial VR simulation in interprofessional education. Since that point, they have demoed many VR sim products and been conducting student trials with a few of them, including body swaps. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
I have a quick question. Okay, thank you for bringing up my slides. Um, all right, so uh, first I have to give uh, props to my communications team at the School of Nursing at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, Jeanette Robinson, our assistant director, is responsible for most of the pictures. I think all of the pictures actually in here. Hopefully I gave her credit on each one. Um, so as Chris said, we uh, at UNC Chapel Hill, we are actually completely the opposite in, in, as far as where we are um, of Stephanie. Um, we are still in trials doing a lot of demos. And so hopefully it'll be helpful to hear those two very different pers you know, perspectives. But we have a lot. I think we have some shared opinions, but different stories. Um, we are right now using grant funding as well as our many schools around the country to, to fund trials of uh, VR simulations that in, include AI as part of the integration to some of them. Um, because these technologies are not integrated into our budgets and strategic plans yet. So we're trying to prove, you know, prove concept and, and prove that these simulations are in fact beneficial for our students and something worthy of being integrated into our program. Um, the use cases that we've identified that we've that we've trialed, um, at least with faculty so far for AI integration specifically, are for uh, practice uh, for practicing just fo focused history taking for like um, for medical exams for in the clinic or hospital environment. Um, also more practicing just general communications with patients that ranges from history taking to telling them about interventions to education to reassurance um, in clinical applications, such as the one being shown behind this, this student here. Uh, that's a clinical scenario. And then the third is the type that Body Swaps uh, specializes in, the practicing difficult conversations or other communication skills that are difficult to teach and to learn. I kind of avoid um, saying soft skills training because I feel like the narrative needs to change to something that gives these soft skills, these these skills more uh, more credit for how important they are. I feel like um, the communication skills and non-technical skills, especially in health professions, are some of the most important skills um, to being an effective nurse or physician or other healthcare provider. Um, one key takeaway, if I say nothing else, is that as far as AI goes, the quality of it and how it's used really varies from product to product. So I definitely suggest anybody that's that's trialing some of these new apps, whether it's VR or, or laptop-based, screen-based tools for simulation. If it includes AI integration, try it yourself. Try it with your peers. You know, bribe your peers in some way. I bribed my peers over the holidays and gave them all headsets, a few headsets out to, to try out some apps with me. Um, and most, most application companies give free demos. And so try it out with your peers and then with students and get, get feedback and really see how consistent these products are and, and whether they seem to be like science-based and how they respond um, when, talk, when talked to. <laughs> so I am gonna just show real quick um, a little bit about our body swaps trial in the fall. Um, we're, st we're still just trialing it out. We haven't actually adopted anything into our program yet, but we did a really, um, I guess for lack of a better word, shotgun approach to trialing uh, body swaps specifically in, um, in our in one of our courses in the fall with BSN students, we had I think 112 BSN students tried it. Uh, the faculty were just they heard about the body swaps um, uh, research grant that we got, we, where we were able to to use it for several months and try it and get feedback, and they were excited and they wanted to try it literally the next week. And so there was no. Um, no real buildup or orientation to the app or to VR. What we decided to do, because Body Swaps is, is available on, you can access it on laptop, on iPad, um, or on VR headset, the students were able to choose based on what device they wanted to use and what they were familiar with. All of our students do have iPads as part of their nursing program, so they all had that method. Um, so I'm gonna show you just two quick results of the student evaluations of this trial. Um, that I collected last fall. And actually, Chris hasn't even seen these yet. <laughs> so uh, we had 112 students. All of them completed um, the evaluation. And how they accessed it, there was 
looks like about 17 students, I believe, use VR headsets. Um, we've learned that nursing students are not gamers, and uh, most of them do not have headsets at home. Um, many of them have never touched a headset. So we could only, because there's so many students and we were doing this so quickly, we decided um, we can only really offer the headsets to those who are already familiar with them. We didn't have time to orient that many students to headsets. Uh, so the rest of them use their iPad or their laptop. So that's an important part of kind of understanding the accessibility as well as the scalability of this type of um, these types of simulation products. It's important to know how they can be accessed. Um, and mo the vast majority of the students, even, despite the fact they were th thrown into this, they had like no real good, not, not a very good orientation to anything. Um, they were very flexible and they really found it um, quite relevant to their nursing program and to their training and communication skills. So out of 112, I didn't even add up these numbers, but about I don't know, about 100 of them said they were either somewhat or extremely satisfied um, with the application as a SIM method. And about the same number said, had, um, said the same thing about it being uh, like a relevant activity to do as part of um, communication skills, non-technical skills training for healthcare. Um, so some of the, just a couple of the last points I would say, um, some of the things um, that I've noticed similar to Stephanie is that in clinical simulation apps specifically, when AI is integrated, it's really important to try those out before you use them with students because I've demoed probably, I don't know, 15 or so, 10 to 15. Um, and some of them are very thoughtfully created and they put them out to market only after they've gone through all kinds of testing and at least internal research um, to make sure that the, the, the patient in the scenario is, is responding in an appropriate way to the student's questions, that the students don't have to like keep saying something over and over to, to say it just right to get a response. Um, and and um, there are other, you know, there are other apps that are, I think they're probably put out a little too quickly, um, maybe quantity over, over quality. And um, sometimes they might give responses that are not, that don't really, where the AI doesn't really add any value. So it's just important to, to test things out, compare the quality um, and test it out both with, with your peers, your colleagues, as well as, as well as your students and really get feedback as to um, the quality and the relevance. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, th thanks a lot for that, uh, Elizabeth. And we are going to jump straight into a new segment, um, the not necessarily a debate. Uh, not necessarily because, uh, well, because I would be very surprised if you if you had major uh, disagreement about any of this, but I mostly wanted to have this justice versus stone uh, visual, that, which sounds amazing. Um, so, um, something you just mentioned, uh, Elizabeth, is is the idea of, of 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 value? I mean, you need to try AI because there are differences in in quality, but 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 the question is why are you doing it in the first place? I would have been interested if you had the numbers comparing the via, the body swaps trial with standardized uh, patients or e-learning. That would have been interesting. But my first question, therefore, is going back to the value, the big picture. What's keeping you up at night? professionally speaking, whether it's, you know, like the, the dreams you have or the nightmares you have about how things are today? Yeah, so um, I would say we need more simulation options. Um, you know, we're all nursing programs are all being, at least I know ours is being really pushed to grow to to be able to feed more students, more, more students, more nurses into the into the workforce to meet the need. Um, and we can only grow so much. I mean, because we can nursing school requires a lot of a lot of uh, clinical practice and simulation um, when done really well can can provide some of the hours of that they can substitute for some of the hours of clinical practice. So simulation is a really important tool in growing a nursing program and also just preparing your nurses for practice, for professional practice. So the more options we have in our simulation toolbox, the more prepared our nurses, our nursing students are going to be for the profession. Okay. So and right now, to... what's that? No, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, and right now, Particularly where I work, we're, we're undergoing a big renovation. We're getting a whole new building. We actually don't have a, a building right now. So we're really, we're kind of in a, in a, I guess, a crisis mode in terms of simulation, a very interesting place where we're really getting very creative and innovative in how we can, um, in other, in looking at other ways to use simulation. So we actually just started trying um, standardized patients uh, recently, um, as well as uh, VR simulation as another option. 
Great. So the, the end goal, of course, is to, is to uh, uh, better prepare your students for the real world. But to get there, you're saying you need just more options for, for simulations to do more, more practice and plug that gap, I would say, between the, the classroom and, uh, and the real world. Uh, Stephanie, same, same question for you. What's keeping it's you up at night? Definitely not a debate because I think I have the same, the same horror, horror, I guess, what keeps me awake at night is enough nurses. Like, how do we get more nurses and not just cranking out numbers, right? We need to make sure that they are competent, that they're able to provide you know, adequate care and not just the skills. I mean, they have to know how to talk not only to the patients, but to other medical professionals. And how do we get them to stay in nursing? And I think that's a big challenge too, because, you know, we can crank out all the nurses we want, but if they leave the profession in one to two years, we're, it's a vicious cycle. It'll never get better. So the more opportunities to practice and to practice in things that like, I wouldn't put them in in clinical. So for example, if I have a patient that is um, potentially violent. I'm not going to throw in my student who has no idea how to handle that person or how to talk to them or how to de-escalate. but I can put them in that in a simulation. And in a virtual simulation, in a headset is a great way because it feels like that person, man, it feels like they're right here in your face and they can have that opportunity to do it. And when it goes poorly, they can do it again and they can keep learning and they can repeat. And that's the challenge when you have standardized patients because you only have so much time, right? So if they do a very poor job, I can't have them do it seven times until they're comfortable on how to talk down to that, get that patient, like talk down from that level of escalation that they're at. But virtually, I can have them practice and they can practice and then they can come back a month later and do it again if they don't remember or they feel uncomfortable again. And that's why I think I love simulation so much as it gives us that opportunity and the repetition because we just don't get that in the sim labs it's hard there's not enough time not enough people not enough space and the hospitals too you know just trying to get enough students in with appropriate clinical instructors so that's i think that's my plug for you know more simulation and the clinical judgment and thinking in that headset great so there's 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 two ideas here that i hear one is Going back to the analogy of the of the flight simulator is the, is the idea of, of safety, right? Like it's, it's okay to crash in a flight simulator. Um, it's not okay to crash a confrontation with a patient. Not only is it not okay for the patient, but also it's not okay for the nurse because if that happens too often, they are leaving uh, they are leaving their, their their job. So the the attrition aspect is interesting, and the other one is the repetition, the repeatability of things, which you don't get for obvious logistical challenges when you do things like uh, like, like standardized patients. Um, uh, Stephanie, back to you. Did, did you have any any maybe anecdotal story, success or fail to share from the from your from your trials with your your students? Well, the one that, you know, probably sticks out to me the most is actually is a patient care scenario that we did. And it's in our pediatric setting. Um, and it was a febrile seizure case. And the student it was a male student. He came in and his body language, his everything, he did not want to be there. He did not want to be in the headset, didn't want to do it, had an attitude of, oh, this is stupid. I don't know why you're making me do it. So he has his headset on and his whole body language is just like this, you know, kind of slumped, not happy. And about a minute in, the patient starts seizing and he didn't know what to do. And he jumped up and started cussing and was like, she's seizing. And he had to do that simulation three times because he didn't know what to do or how to treat that person and how to take care of her safely. And the realism that he felt when it kicked in, you know, he was in the room with the patient, he was in the room doing this. He forgot he was sitting in the sim lab thinking this was, or in the VR lab thinking this was stupid. And to me, that's one of the best things. Or a student comes back and is like, you know, we do some empathy training. I've had people take the headset off and they have tears in their eyes because of how emotional they felt in some of those, um, I like non-essential skills. That does sound better than soft skills. I really like that better. But you know, how do you teach empathy? Well, you have to put them in those situations and let them feel. And that's very hard to do when you're teaching. I can't do that in lecture, which doesn't work. It's, um, it's, it's interesting because what I read in, in what you said is, and it echoes a little bit your presentation is, is this impact that you mentioned has to do with the immersion, the VR side, uh, more than the AI side, um, and it has to do with 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 being in a headset, which is 
both the magic of the device, but also the limitations in terms of the de of deployment. And in your in your numbers, Elizabeth, you only had less than twenty percent of people who who did it with a VR headset. So there's a it, interesting like trade off to find here between scale and impact, repeatability and impact. Um, uh, do do you have also a, an anecdote to 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 share with us, Elizabeth? Yeah, sure. Just in in general, in regards to simulation, I think. Um, um, what we found is that, as I said, you know, in regards to the body swaps trial, we did that very quickly. Um, I wish we had put more time into planning it, uh, but I had a, I had an opportunity to try it at, during a class that was going to be focused on difficult conversations. So I had to had to take that opportunity, um, even though it was just a week later. Uh, what I, what we found is that, especially when trying to um, when trialing VR simulation or integrating VR simulation, the orientation is very important to invest in. Like, don't assume students are going to uh, know how to use these headsets. I was told they would by people that are outside of nursing. But the funniest lesson I've learned is that nursing students, like I said, are not gamers. They do not know how to use headsets that you can't assume they do, at least. I've, we've, we've had maybe 5% of each cohort that we've that we've done trials with so far may have some familiar with uh, familiarity with the headset. So we, now we put uh, about an about an hour into orienting students to the headset and to the app that they're going to be trying before we trial anything with a student because if they're from, if they if they're comfortable with it and maybe have a little bit of fun with that orientation like letting them play a play a game a benign game like one of the orientation games um, on the if we use Quest the Quest the First steps for first steps. It helps. It help. It teaches them how to how to use the hand controllers in a really fun way. It's kind of a Disney like way. They're very relaxed after that. Plus, they understand how to use everything, and then then they can take in the knowledge of the simulation, and they're not focused on technical glitches or whether they're making mistakes. So, really, making sure you you know um, invest in that orientation process so that they can get the most out of the applications that you're trying. And I have to yeah. tag in on that too, just because our we're in our second year of the grant, and the first year we we did the oh no they'll pick it up really quick they're tech savvy and didn't do an orientation, and it was awful. Um, students did not like it um, because they didn't know how to work it, and we've built in a formal orientation now, and it it has made all the difference in the world in how they react and interact with the headsets and the simulations. So I have to echo that, that please don't forget your orientation. It's essential. Yeah, this is, this is something we, we've seen again and again. Um, I think one, one element is, is, is the, 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 the technical orientation, getting, getting students to familiarize themselves with the headsets. Another element of the orientation is the, 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 the curriculum orientation. What's in it for you? Why, why should you care? Um, and you're absolutely right. You, in 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 terms of not overestimating the the, the tech savviness and and the appetite for this, um, there's something you mentioned, Stephanie, when you gave your anecdotes. Um, you mentioned, for example, someone crying in the in in an empathy uh, a, a training uh, module. Um, obviously, you don't want to be crying in front of of of, of the other students. So, how do you bring together this orientation bit, which I guess has to be with a group? but also protecting the psychological safety of students. How important is that? Well, that that's huge. Actually, we have had, um, the, the one in particular that I was thinking of is a homelessness scenario that they go through. And I do usually have about eight students in the lab at the same time doing the same experience. Um, but for ones where they're, they actually have to speak when they're in a headset, they don't want anyone else in the room. And that has been a challenge for us because our VR lab is a thousand square foot, big empty room. Um, so we have actually done a lot of our um, more empathy type training or, you know, things like microaggressions or bias or something where they're talking about a personal experience of letting them do that at home more on the tablet or the computer because they need that safety. They don't know who's listening, who's in the room, and they don't participate fully. If you have a whole room full of people and they have to share something personal, you're not going to get that same level. So we're looking into how do we, where else can we put them in the college where they're in a private space with a headset so that they do have that safety of nobody's going to hear what I'm saying. And it is just me doing this training. Um, and that's a little challenging um, because we have about 700 pre-licensure students. Um, 
And so trying to find spots to put them in throughout the you know week is, is not easy, but we are working on that. Um, but you do have to think of that safety, that, that what are they feeling, who's hearing, and are they really going to participate? Because I wouldn't if I was in a room with a lot of people. You know, I'd be much more quiet and I wouldn't know who was next to me because I can't see them in the headset. Yeah, it's a bit like doing doing role play with a blindfold on. It's um, yeah. it's yeah. Elizabeth, do you have anything to add on the on the psychological safety aspect or, or some tips for 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 deployment in general? Yeah. So uh, psychological safety is one of the most important uh, things I think for students, and that's also what they have said in in open ended feedback. That's what they've said they like the most about um, VR simulations, particularly whether they integrate AI or not. Uh, is that they are having this safe, psychologically safe experience. Um, they're, a lot of times they're getting analytics based on the product. Most products will give them some sort of analytics that are individual to them um, so that they can learn, but not, they don't have a bunch of eyes on them looking at their performance. Um, yeah, we when we did the trial uh, with, with body swaps, for example, we let them scatter into basically any space around campus that had Wi-Fi. Um, and we did get similar feedback. They, they um, It was interesting. Our BS, We tried it with our BSN students who are younger students. Um, other, we have second degree students as well, but our BSN students, the traditional ones, they didn't talk about the, you know, being worried about their peers hearing them as much as the second degree students that are a little bit older. Um, so that was an interesting little, little, mm -hmm. um, bit of data. But in general, I think it is really important, especially, especially with the the training on non-technical skills that are more kind of personal, kind of emotional experiences. Um, and they can be, you know, they can be about some pretty difficult conversations and um, in uncomfortable situations. Most people are going to want to be doing that in private if they're having to say things out loud. Um, so the clinical scenarios, when we do clinical simulations, the students don't mind at all, um, in my experience, being in a big room spread out. And they also don't even hear each other. They don't typically hear each other because they can hear their the set their own headset and they can't really hear each other's. Um, it's just when you're doing um, non-technical skills training with communication skills and that sort of thing that they really want that privacy. Great. That's that's fantastic. I We've talked about the learners. I'd like to talk about the uh, the faculty and, and and leadership and what's been, you know, I showed these slides was like the Daily Mail and 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 Mark uh, Mark Andreessen. Like, where, what's the mood in in your institutions? How difficult or easy has it been to get to get some so some buy in? And importantly, do you have any tips for educators here looking to get buy in internally? Stephanie, if you want to go first. Sure. Um, so we were very fortunate because we got we got a grant, which let us put it, you know, very much into our program at, at a very fast speed. You know, so everybody was kind of they knew it was coming, you know, so it wasn't a big shock. But I think most of our faculty like it. I have some that don't. I mean, you know, that's not a surprise. Not everybody's going to like it. But if you think of, I love Roger's diffusion of innovation theory. That is my favorite, right? I'm always on the, like, I love technology. I love new things. And then we have the laggards and I still have laggards two years in. I have some people who just still, they, I mean, they use it because they, they, they're supposed to, but they don't love it. And I'm okay with that. But I think to get your leadership and your faculty to actually buy into it is you need to put them in a headset. I can talk until I'm blue in the face about how immersive it is, how amazing it is to talk to this patient or to do this scenario. And it's just words, but you put them in the headset and I don't care if you just throw them in first steps and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm like in this room and they're like spinning around and they're like just blown away at the realism when I know I'm not really dancing with a robot and shooting <laughs> off bottle rockets, right? Like that's not... I'm in a room clicking buttons and doing goofy things with my hands, but they get that feeling, that immersion. And you can't really create that buy-in with just the words. I think you have to get a, get them in, get them playing in it, and then put them in that, like one of the scenarios. So we had something for, you know, communicating with, you know, a suicidal patient, something more challenging or a patient care scenario. And then they're going to get it. They're going to see what's important. Thanks. I, I saw a lot of nodding on your side, Elizabeth. Anything to, to add to this? 
Yeah, sim similar. I think so, you know, speaking from a place where we don't have, we have a small grant. And so I have had to get some faculty buy in to, to let me trial it. Um, uh, you know, A, I think, you know, just like as in with quality improvement projects, kind of as an analogy, you have to be able to show the value. So I kind of approach it from, you know, figure out a way to make their life easier, figure out a problem to help solve with them. Um, to, so with, with the course where we try all the difficult conversations, applications, we, um, I just, I gave each faculty member a headset, said, please take this home, try it. If, if you feel like these are uh, relevant exercises for your course, I'll come facilitate it for you. Um, and also making it clear that there, you know, when there are multiple ways to access a, a VR product, if you can access it on laptop, uh, tablet and VR headset, that's also really helpful because some people are very initially against the VR headset for whatever reason and or or may think that's a barrier. And um, so it's it's the accessibility is really important to us, at least. And we so we really value the fact, you know, we, we're only looking at products that are accessible on at least two different types of devices. Um, I personally think that casting VR products to a large screen, like in a conference room, for example, um, is a pretty immersive way to experience um, these activities, even if you're not in a headset. That's, to, in my in my opinion, that's my, that's the second best, second most immersive way is just to cast it to a larger screen, um, either preferably in a, in a room, like a large, like a classroom screen. But that that's important. That's been very helpful. Just, you know, identifying something that you can help them help them with. Um, and then also getting like communications teams buy in, like sharing your plans for demos, for trials with communications teams where you work, because they're very, they're great supporters and they'll come take pictures and then that will help, you know, they'll write stories and that'll help build enthusiasm and support in your colleagues and in your leadership. Um, so those have been kind of two two strategies we've mm. used. Great. So I, from what you both said, in terms of tips, uh, get people in headsets uh, is one. Uh, two is, but don't forget there are other other ways as well. And you can, you know, uh, broadcast someone in a headset to the rest of the classroom. People can, uh, can do it at home. Um, um, remember, show value. Most VR apps, AI apps have a lot of data. Uh, and that's that's uh, uh, that's powerful. And the last one is, well, VR is inherently, let's say, social media friendly, for lack of a, of a better term. So do get communications team teams involved. Uh, the I would say the internal battle for hearts and minds is 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 sometimes won with with images as well. Um, so that's mm -hmm. those are some of the some of the takeaways. Last question for the debate that hasn't really been so much of a debate. Uh, so let's let's give us that. Uh, let me try. Big question is simulations, standardized patients, and clinical placements. Looking a little bit of a couple of years down the line, how do you see those playing with one another? How should simulations replace standardized patients, complement? Can placement hours be done in, 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 in VR? What do you see the, the, the future role of simulations? Stephanie. Um, you know, for me, I think we need all three. I mean, to be honest, I, I love I love VR. I love, you know, screen based, headset based simulations. And I think they're very important. But I think they're just a piece of the puzzle, because I think the problem is, is if we're trying to replace something, is it necessarily as good or better? Or does it just add another option? So another experience for them. So, for example, sometimes talking to a real person is good because a real person acts different than a fake person. And I don't care how you simulate it, be it a mannequin, be it, you know, virtually, it's not quite the same as a real human being that you can touch and is physically very close to you. I think the benefit of more and more simulation is we can give more experiences to our students. And in these cases too, we can do individual simulations. And it doesn't matter if that's a skill or a non-technical, it's a one-on-one -on -one for a lot of these. And that's something that's really not that possible in either the clinical setting or the sim lab, because in the sim lab, we usually have a small group of students that go through and do mannequin or standardized patient simulations. But in the clinical setting, there's always someone making sure they don't make a mistake, right? Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, go have fun and, you know, hope you don't mess up on a real person. But I can do that in 
the VR and the screen based. I can put just one student in that experience and I can see how they're thinking. They can work on their clinical you know, judgment, their reasoning, their thought process. And you can actually go back and look at, we, you know, why did you do this and, and, and explore? And I feel like we can build more of these virtual experiences throughout the curriculum to make it much richer, right? Instead of just writing a paper, you're going to go experience that. Or instead of just studying a process or a communication technique, you're actually going to go practice it. So you get that, that experiential learning in a safe way so that if you make a mistake, it's okay. And nobody's going to get hurt, including yourself. Sounds brilliant. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I, I agree. I think they're all important. None of them should, uh, they, they're all very important for different reasons. They all have different, uh, different pros, different unique capabilities. Uh, I personally like a scaffolded approach. I recently saw um, our mental health nursing instructor um, for undergraduate nursing students did VR simulations with me. Um, we did two scenarios. One was generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, the other one was a suicidal ideation uh, scenario. We did those with her mental health uh, nursing undergraduates. And then a couple weeks later, they had a standardized patient simulation um, with, that was, um, it was, they were having to practice, the students were having to practice de-escalate, um, de-escalation of a of an angry patient, of a very anxious patient um, having a mental health crisis. And it was really, I think it was really helpful for them to practice in VR some of the same skills and then apply them to a real person, but in a safe space, in the simulation space, standardized patient who they, they know they're not going to be touched by that standardized patient. You know, they're not, not going to be attacked, where in the healthcare environment they could be. Um, so it was, I, I really, I'm a big fan now after seeing that of kind of a scaffolded approach using the very, and then, you know, so, and then they'll of course have clinical practice as well, but they may or may not have the same, you know, in clinical practice, we can't really control what patients or students are always going to have. So um, I think, you know, having various methods allows you to scaffold the teaching and experience, but also ensure they get certain experiences across the program if we feel like they're important experiences to have. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, you had a surprise for me, Elizabeth, by bringing up some some body swaps data. Um, I, I have one for you, um, uh, which is that I'm bringing a surprise uh, last uh, person to the panel, uh, and that's an AI. Uh, so we're going to ask the AI what they think about it. So just to show people how easy it is, uh, this is something I did in, in under half an hour, and it was completely free. So I went on chat GPT. I ask, what does the AI think about the pros and cons of replacing standardized patient with AI-powered simulations? It gave me an answer with uh, some bullet points, which was a bit boring. So I say, well, can you please answer with full sentences, first person, be human, be grumpy, be fun, have a sense of humor, and so on. Then I went on 11 labs uh, to choose an AI voice. Um, for no reason, I chose uh, Giovanni, who has an Italian accent. And then I went on DID to choose an avatar. Uh, and because Giovanni is Italian, I have an avatar of a Roman looking uh, statue. Uh, so I introduce you to Giovanni AI, and we're going to listen to what Giovanni AI has to say about the, the topic. On the bright side, embracing AI for communication skills, training is like having an all you can eat buffet of practice opportunities. You can go back for seconds, thirds, even tenths without judgment, and talk about a safe space. It's just you and the AI, no room for embarrassment or ridicule, but, and there's always a but, it's a bit like rehearsing Shakespeare with a toaster. Sure, it can recite lines, but can it match the subtle art of human emotion? There's a richness to human interaction that AI just can't replicate yet. And let's not forget, not everyone's on the digital bandwagon. For some, accessing these high-tech tools might as well be a quest for the holy grail. So while AI simulations can be a cost-effective, safe training ground, they're not going to replace the nuanced, often unpredictable, but profoundly human experience of practicing with real people anytime soon. But hey, if you can teach a grumpy old AI like me new tricks, there might be hope for us all. So it's pretty interesting exercise. I think there's a lot of points that it hits uh, that that uh, that you hit as well. And and once again, 
Um, it sounds scary the, the the first time around, but it was it was quite easy to create. And and Lori, uh, there are free versions of all of these applications if you want to create that for fun for your course um, and so on. Um, we have a couple of minutes uh, to take some questions, uh, some questions from uh, from the comment section. I'm going to bring one up uh, from Rene. I currently teach mental health nursing and use standardized patients with students, which is interesting, not with professional actors. Um, it sounds like the use of it at home prior to live SP might be useful and valuable. That seems to echo your 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 point, uh, Elizabeth. But would you say that you would rather do it in VR with an orientation on campus as opposed to home? It depends. Yeah, definitely orientation on campus if you're using a VR headset. I mean, they have to know how to use the headset well. Uh, it depends if they're... So we did clinical mental health nursing scenarios that were not AI language driven. So the students in these did not, they use drop down menus for communication and intervention. So in that case, if you have that type of product, you can do it on campus. But I, I definitely, in my opinion, I like the use of um, VR simulation before standardized patient because it, it got that they were able to practice and get more comfortable with the scenarios and situations. Um, but if you're using a, a, you know, communication skills training, such as body swaps, that is the student actually speaking, then yeah, doing it at home or in a private space on, on campus would be, I think would be valuable. And one thing I can add on this that we really didn't touch on is one of the bonuses of doing some of these virtual simulations is if even if it is a drop down or it's a question that you're answering, it can role model ways to ask those questions or how to say something or how to respond, you know, because sometimes and, and it happens to me a lot, right? Somebody asks you a question and you're not quite sure how to answer. And this can actually present a nice role model of how to handle that question or that situation, which I think could be interesting for Renee's question, because if the student's playing the standardized patient, they might get some tips on how to actually act because maybe they're not 100% sure. So it could be helpful for both, you know, the person pretending to be the, the patient as well to see a virtual version of whatever type of mental health disorder you're looking at. Very interesting. One last question from, uh, from the comment section. Do you see a place where AI is utilized not for students, but in continuing education and development for nurses that are already practicing? Because they have practice every day, do they still need a simulation on, on, on the side? What do you think? I, I think it's a great idea. I, I think there's a lot of ways that we could use this um, in orientation, in working with practicing nurses, you know, continuing education. Maybe it's something about working with like a new skill or a new, um, I don't know, new treatment option that you see because there's so many options coming out in VR. Um, also too, if you change units, you know, if I was in, I don't know, med surge and now I'm on oncology, you know, a simulation on dealing with more of those difficult conversations that you're going to have with like newly diagnosed terminal patients, right? That could be so helpful, um, as a practicing nurse. And I've been a nurse for over 20 years and that would be helpful because I've not worked oncology. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. We, we're going to move to, uh, a word from our sponsor, which is ourselves. Uh, but before we do that, do you have one last one last advice for for educators on here today? Um, I guess mine would be if you haven't tried a virtual simulation or a VR experience, you you really should. Um, I think there's so much we can do, and the technology is just getting better and better and better. Um, so trying these out and seeing what your students could do and how you could use it as an additional teaching tool. I, I just think it's amazing. So I recommend you hop in a headset if you can. I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, capitalize on free demos. Every application offers free demos. They, they range anywhere from a couple weeks to a few months. So you may, be, may even be able to talk somebody into letting you demo a product for a semester or enough of a semester to really try it with a whole cohort of students. Um, of course, you need the you need at least a few faculty that know how to use the headset. But um, yeah, I capitalize free demos, compare them, really find out, you know, really do your research and talk to people who are, are using it and learn from others. Um, use LinkedIn to connect with people that 
or that are, you know, ahead, you know, ahead of where you want to be. So like if, you know, I've connected with many people like Stephanie to learn from them, um, to learn, you know, get their lessons learned and their tips. And it's been very helpful. Fantastic. Well, speaking of, uh, of companies that you might convince to, uh, to do a, to do a demo, um, we are one of those. Um, so wanted to, to talk quickly about something quite exciting. So we, we're introducing a, a, a package of simulations that we call the Modern Nurse, which is built on the American Association of Colleges of Nursing new essentials uh, framework. Um, there are four modules available at the moment. The Team Steps Simulator, which is for inter interprofessional communication, is released on Tuesday. Um, so if you're a little bit patient, you'll be able to, uh, to try it out. Uh, then we have Navigating Angry Conversation, which is a topic that you mentioned. Uh, we are also releasing on Tuesday a US version, uh, Communicating in a Person-Centered Way and Equity and Anti-Racism in Global Healthcare. And we have more uh, experiences uh, coming later this year uh, as well. On, on AI, because we mentioned AI, none of the conversations in there are generated. AI is used uh, mostly for feedback. Uh, so to, to give hyper personalized feedback to people on whether they use the team steps tools in, in the right way uh, and um, and so on so it's built against some of the domains of the acn that you can read on the right person-centered care collaborating with diverse stakeholders interprofessional partnerships professionalism and things around uh, around leadership so hopefully this should be very helpful for your students but also easier for faculty to understand um, how uh, how they can uh, integrate it as well. Um, we have a study that's ongoing with uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, 25 healthcare programs are enrolled. Uh, we have 130 learners uh, so far. They all tried one body swaps module. There's great appetite for the level of engagement that they find uh, during, uh, during simulations. Um, there's a high report on increase in confidence to apply the soft skills, which is different from understanding. And finally, and that's an important one, not that simulation should replace standardized uh, a patient, but if you think in terms of the cost per hour of simulation per student, um, digital simulation are cheaper, it's obvious. And I think when you do your, your scaffolded uh, 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 activities, like Elizabeth uh, mentioned, there's a lot more practice that you can do at the beginning so that the standardized patient is very valuable and you fine tuning the, the skills rather than working on the basics. Those should have been covered in the simulation. And then when you go on the, in the hospital, you are actually uh, fully ready. So we're going to go back for one second uh, to uh, the Dunning-Kruger uh, line. So this is where we were at the beginning. Um, if you go back on it, um, I would like you to answer that question again. And we're going to see uh, if there has been uh, if there has been any movement, if we have reshaped that uh, that, that 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 mountain of knowledge, so go back onto Menti. Uh, in the meantime, I see that some people uh, have uh, went on and answered the second question. So I'll I'll cover that whilst whilst you guys participate. Most people agree that there is more psychological safety uh, with AI and simulations, and that the data can be useful. Um, on the dangers of AI, teaching counterproductive habits, debate is on kind of in the middle. Um, and then I don't know how many people responded to that second slide, but it seems that um, that people think that immersive simulation can actually um, match, uh, match a certain level of, of sophistication. So going back here, uh, we have five people so far who feel on the slope of, uh, of enlightenment. Um, I leave it there because this is, uh, this is a very good result. A plateau of sustainability. If someone was on the peak of Mount Stupid now, I would be very disappointed, uh, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So that's, um, that is fantastic. And last but not least, uh, to conclude today's presentation, uh, I asked uh, our friend Giovanni AI uh, to write jokes about nursing and AI. Uh, the first two were terrible. I'm going to let you hear the third one. How many AI programmers does it take to change a light bulb? How many AI programmers does it take to change a light bulb in a hospital? None. They just build a nurse robot that can work in the dark. <laughs> they can just build a nurse robot that can work in the dark. I'm not sure the AI realizes how creepy an answer that is. And I think it's quite a good metaphor for the, the limited thinking of AI so far, because that would be 
a terrible hospital to be a patient at. Um, so that concludes uh, today's uh, today's talk. If you want to try body swaps, um, you can scan the QR code. Uh, if you don't have time to scan the QR code now, you can find the video on YouTube or you can write to Tyler at bodyswaps.co if you're in the US or to Janie if you're anywhere else in the world. And if you don't remember those those uh, those emails, you can just go on bodyswaps.co and uh, all the information in there. Elizabeth, Stephanie, thanks a lot for your time today. Um, very amazing, very insightful. Um, and I'm looking forward to speaking to you soon. And bye, everyone. Thanks for coming.